In this video, I am going to solve this question. The following model of consumption is estimated for an economy for the years 1947 to 2000. This is the regression model that's given to us and this is how the variables are defined. Ln over here indicates natural log. The OLS residuals are then regressed on these three variables and this is the equation that we get. The above regression is reported to have R square of 0 0.0983. Perform Bruce Godfrey test to check for the presence of autocorrelation at 5% level of significance. This is a straightforward question. Let's take a look at the information that's given to us. So first of all, note that this is a time series data. So we have data for the years 1947 to 2000. And because this is a time series data, that's why we have T as subscripts over here. Generally speaking, when we work with cross-sectional data, we put I in the subscript. On the other hand, while working with the time series data, we put T as the subscript. Okay. So basically, we have to test for the presence of autocorrelation and the test that we are working with is Bruce godfrey test. Well, according to the Bruce godfrey test, this equation over here is called auxiliary regression. Okay, so we have a term for this regression. It is called auxiliary regression. And this R square that you see over here, it is for this auxiliary regression. Okay, now let's take a look at the test procedure. So first of all, let's write the null hypothesis. Under this test procedure, the null hypothesis is that all the coefficients, so all the coefficients of the lagged residual terms of the lagged residual terms are simultaneously equal to zero. Are simultaneously equal to zero. So in the Bruce Godfrey test, this is what we have to write in the null hypothesis. Right now, I have written a statement over here, but this statement is only for your understanding. Soon, I'm going to write a mathematical expression over here. Okay, so according to this statement, the null hypothesis is that all the coefficients of the lag residual terms are simultaneously equal to zero. So first of all, let's understand the meaning of this statement. The first thing that you have to note over here that this statement is for the auxiliary regression. The only role of this regression is that we use this particular regression to find the residuals. So basically, when we estimate this model number one, we get the sample errors, which you can also call residuals. And the residuals that you get after the estimation of model number one, those residuals become the dependent variable in your auxiliary regression. So the only importance of this equation number one is that it gives us the residuals. Once we have the residuals, there is nothing more that we have to do with the first equation. So once we have the residuals, we don't need this because after getting the residuals, our entire focus is on the auxiliary regression. Okay, so this null hypothesis is also related to the auxiliary regression. Basically, it is saying that all the coefficients of the lagged residual terms are simultaneously equal to zero. Now, if you take a look at this auxiliary regression, there is only one lagged residual term and that is ET minus one. Now, see, it's not necessary that you're always going to have only one lagged residual term. You can also have those kind of cases where you can have one more lagged residual term. So I can also add a5, which is the parameter, and the variable is et minus 2. I can also write et minus 3 as one of the other variables, and the parameter is a6. Okay. So you know, you can also have those kind of cases where you have more lagged residual terms. And basically, there are criteria available to select the number of lagged residual terms that you're going to get. So according to this null hypothesis, if I add ET minus 2 and ET minus 3 as well, then the null hypothesis will be written as A4 equal to A5 equal to A6 equal to 0. Okay, so this null hypothesis is saying that the coefficients of the lagged residual terms are simultaneously equal to 0. So if I add two more lagged residual terms, then in total, I will have three lagged residual terms. So in this particular case, my null is going to be A4, A5, A6. All three of these are equal to zero. Okay, so I hope you understand the meaning of the null hypothesis now. In the question that we are given, we do not have multiple lagged residual terms. 
So we just have one lakh residual term. So I can remove this A5 and A6. So basically in our question, our entire focus is going to be on this A4. So in our question, the null hypothesis is going to be that A4 is equal to zero and the alternative hypothesis is going to be that A4 is not equal to zero. If you want, you can also write A4 greater than zero over here instead of not equal to zero. This is because generally speaking, while working with economic data, we usually don't worry about the possibility of negative serial correlation that much. Consequently, we generally consider only the possibility of positive serial correlation. So that means if there is some sort of autocorrelation and if you're working with economic data, then generally speaking, it's going to be positive. And this is the reason you can also write your alternative as A4 greater than zero. So this is the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis that we are going to work with. Well, you must know by now that whenever we have to do some sort of hypothesis testing, there are two types of values that we need to find. We need to find calculated value of the test statistic. Okay, so one is the calculated value of the test statistic and one is the critical value of the test statistic. And once we have the calculated value and the critical value, then we compare these two values to see whether we are going to reject the null hypothesis or not reject the null hypothesis. So according to this test, if you want to find the calculated value, you can find it by using the formula n multiplied with r square. Note that this n that I have written over here, this is sample size of the auxiliary regression. So this is sample size of the auxiliary regression. So this is for the auxiliary regression. Similarly, this r square that we have over here in the formula, it is also for the auxiliary regression. Okay, now let's see what are these values. So it's clearly given over here that R square is 0 0.0983. So I'm yet to talk about N, but I know for sure that R square is 0 0.0983. Now the question is, what is N over here? That means what is the sample size of the auxiliary regression? And this is something you need to pay attention to. So let's try to figure out what is the sample size over here. First of all, note that we are working with the time series data and the data is for the years 1947 to 2000. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to figure out the sample size of this model number one. So the sample size of the model number one is going to be 54. Note that the sample size of the model number one is not 53. Many students just do 2000 minus 1947, which is equal to 53. Well, this is not right. Reason being in the calculation of the total number of time periods, you have to include 1947 as well as 2000. So if you include 1947 as well as 2000, you will see that the total number of time periods is equal to 54. That means the sample size corresponding to this particular model is 54. Okay, now if the sample size of the first model is 54, that means from this model, we are going to have 54 values of ET. So I'm writing over here that we are going to have 54 values of ET. Okay, now if you take a look at the auxiliary regression, then ET is the dependent variable. Okay, so the dependent variable has 54 values. But if you pay attention to the right hand side, there is also ET minus 1 on the right hand side. So if ET has 54 values, then ET minus 1 is going to have 53 values. Think of it in this manner. Let me create a column for ET and let's imagine some values over here. So let's say the first value is 28. I'm just writing some random values. The second value is 24. The third value is 13 and so on. Okay, and let's say these are 54 values in total. Now, if you try to find the value of ET minus 1, then you will not be able to find the first value. The second value of ET minus 1 will become 28, which is this. The third value of ET minus 1 will become 24, which is this. The fourth value of ET minus 1 will become 13, which is this. So basically for ET minus 1, if you keep on going like this, for ET minus 1, you will only have 53 values because you will end up losing the first value. Okay, so for ET, you have 54 values. For ET minus 1, you have 53 values. That means the sample size of the auxiliary regression is going to be 53 and not 54. Okay, and this is because one of the independent variables have 53 values, right? I'm repeating this again that for the auxiliary regression, ET has 54 values. 
PDI also have 54 values. So this also have 54 values. INT also have 54 values, but ET minus one has 53 values. So because one of the variables that is there in the auxiliary regression has 53 values, that means the sample size is also going to be 53. It cannot be 54 right so n over here is actually 53 so instead of this question mark i can just write 53 okay so this is one of the things that you need to be really careful about whenever you're working with this type of test that you have to make sure that you find your sample size correctly now if you do this multiplication you will get that this is equal to 5.2099 so the calculated value is 5.2099 and for that we have used this formula because this is the formula that was proposed under the Bruce Godfrey test to find the calculated value. Now under this test to find the critical value we have to use chi square with one degree of freedom. How do we know that the degrees of freedom is going to be one? So this is your degrees of freedom. DOF means degrees of freedom. Well this is because according to the test procedure the degrees of freedom is equal to number of lagged residual terms in the auxiliary regression. So degrees of freedom have to be equal to number of lagged residual terms. So in this case, how many lagged residual terms do we have in the auxiliary regression? Only one, et minus one is there, right? So in this case, to find the critical value, we are going to use chi square and the degrees of freedom is going to be one. And we are already given that alpha is equal to 5%. Now there is one last thing that you need to be careful about that let's say this is how the chi-square distribution looks like. So I'm just drawing a rough figure. This is not the exact figure for one degree of freedom, but this is just a rough figure for your visualization. Your alpha is equal to 5%. You need to make sure that your entire 5% is over here. To find the critical value, you need to make sure that the entire 5% is over here. And this value over here is going to be the critical value. So if you take a look at the chi-square table, you will find that this value is 3.84. So the critical value is equal to 3.84. The calculated value is 5.2099. If I try to plot the calculated value on the same figure, then it will lie somewhere over here that is to the right of 3.84. That means the calculated value is lying in the rejection region. So in this case, we are going to reject the null hypothesis. So we are going to reject the null hypothesis. That means we are going to reject this claim. So the conclusion is that according to this particular test, there is some evidence of autocorrelation at 5% level of significance.